So, hello, my name is Laura Brandis and I'm the Communications Director at the Polis Water Sustainability Project here at the University of Victoria. And I want to welcome you to today's webinar, um, which happens to be the final webinar in this year's Creating a Blue Dialogue webinar series. This is a series that we've been running for, for four years now and we'll be kicking it off again in the fall. So um, you can stay tuned for more information on next year's series um, in the coming months. There was significant interest and enthusiasm for today's session. We are expecting a sellout crowd, um, so I really want to thank you all for being here. Uh, I know a number of you on the line have attended our webinars in the past. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I will tell you a little bit about this series. And the goal of it really is to bring together in one virtual space uh, water leaders and professionals from a diversity of backgrounds to engage with emerging and priority issues on water policy and governance. And today's webinar, as you all know, I hope, um, is going to focus on the notion of resilience thinking and what this can mean for watershed-based decision making. Um, and then we'll also hear about the work of the Canadian Watershed Research Consortium. Now, of course, we, uh, we couldn't carry out this series with, without the support of our various partners. Um, so all of them are on the slide here. I want to say thank you to all of them. In particular, um, a big thank you to the Canadian Water Network, who has been our core supporter of this year's series and actually our past few years of series as well. Um, and also a specific thank you to Water Canada Magazine, who is our media sponsor. Now, before I hand things over to the speakers, um, there's always a few housekeeping items that I like to run through. Uh, the first thing has to do with audio. As I'm sure you've all realized, I have a blanket mute over everybody. Um, because we're expecting over 100 listeners, uh, what this means is we won't have ridiculous audio chaos feedback <laughs> distracting us from the presentations at hand. Um, so that may raise the question, how do we deal with questions? Um, I see a number of you are already using the chat box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Um, after both Ryan and Simon present, um, that's how we'll handle questions. You can type in there. I'll serve as the moderator, facilitator, reading them out, and Ryan and Simon will be, will be available as our two-man panel. Um, and also, speaking of the chat box, I think now is a really nice opportunity for you to introduce yourself. I know we're getting the, the cross-country weather report, which I love. It's uh, beautiful and sunny here in Victoria. Um, but it's also nice to just get a sense of the community that we have here in the room. I know we're all scattered across the country in our own little insular offices. So um, if you want to just uh, let us know who you are, what organization you're with, um, and also how many people are listening on your end, that'll help us to feel like we're a little bit more of a community here today. So today's speakers, um, first, first up today will be Ryan Plummer. Um, and if there's one thing I've learned about Ryan, it's well, first, that he's lovely to work with, and uh, secondly, that he wears a lot of professional hats. <laughs> so he's director of the Brock Environmental Sustainability Research Center. He's a professor in the Department of Tourism and Environment at Brock University. He's a senior research fellow with the Stockholm Resilience Center, and he's a faculty investigator in the Water Policy and Governance Group at the University of Waterloo. And Ryan's multifaceted research program broadly concerns the governance of social ecological systems and water resources for the context within which Ryan really explores these issues. Our second speaker today is going to be Simon Courtney, um, and he's the scientific director at the Canadian Water Network. Um, and he's also a professor in the Environment and Resource Studies Department at the University of Waterloo. Uh, Ryan, or <laughs> I keep doing this, Ryan, Simon, Simon, Ryan. Simon um, started in both of these roles just this past fall, um, and before then he was a research scientist with uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada for about 23 years based in New Brunswick. Um, he's also worked with the Canadian Rivers Institute, um, and today he's joining us to discuss the work of the uh, Canadian Watershed Research Consortium um, and its focus on supporting regional cumulative effects analysis and decision making. So with that introduction, and as you continue to introduce yourselves in the chat box, um, it's my pleasure to hand things over to Ryan. Thanks so much, Laura, 
for uh, your warm introduction and uh, welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, I want to certainly thank Polis for inviting me to uh, contribute to their series and also Simon um, for, for having such a fun fellow panelist today. Um, we've had a good time putting this together, so I hope uh, it's informative uh, and enjoyable for, for people. Um, I'll be sharing a few thoughts today on resilience thinking and the future of watersheds. And I really have three main aims. I, I want to share a little bit about um, what resilience thinking entails and, and why it's important to watersheds. Uh, the second main aim, main aim is to uh, provide some examples uh, where we're experimenting and, and doing research on the ground uh, with resilience thinking in the watershed context. And the third aim is I hope that this provides a springboard uh, for some dialogue and discussion. It's a real treat to have so many people from, from Canada and beyond uh, in one room, as Laura refers to it, and I look forward very much to our, our discussion at the end. So with those aims in mind, I'll, I'll get started. Um, I think a, a good place to start off is kind of say what was our conventional approach to natural resource management. And if we uh, think about images that embody some of the way we have approached water and, and associated resources, there, there's a real emphasis on uh, control. And if we're to think and brainstorm some terms associated with that, we're predicated on, on assumptions about predictability, stability, and we're trying to maximize the yield out of a lot of our resources by, by controlling them. And if we similarly think about images and experiences that many of you may be having currently around your watersheds, and we think of a, a typical picture of a watershed, um, as these images appear, you may have experience with them. And really, I think they embody a different type of contemporary challenge that we're experiencing. So um, we have different values uh, associated with, with elements of watersheds. We have complex, greater complexity. We have the speed of change is increasing. Uh, the degree of uncertainty is, is uh, becoming amplified. Um, and so, so that's manifesting itself in all kinds of different, uh, different ways in our watersheds. And what this leads to as we're engaging, I think, with this contemporary suite of, of challenges um, is we need to start thinking and understanding uh, things in a different way. And clearly, we're not going to solve our past challenges um, if we don't come at them in a different way. And uh, much of this, then, is, is this shift, this fundamental shift between a nature balance perspective and a nature evolving perspective. Uh, it brings in these ideas of complex adaptive systems. And, and this is where really this idea of resilience thinking, and on the screen you'll see just a, a sample of a, some of the recent um, books written on the subject. Um, but really resilience thinking starts to uh, give us a new way of, of thinking about and engaging with some of these challenges. And so, of course, the the big question is, what do I mean by resilience thinking? And I use resilience thinking, and today, certainly in our, our presentation and with the limited time we have, um, I would encourage us to use resilience thinking as an umbrella. So it encompasses a number of more specific concepts and constructs that people from around the world, uh, many of you, have been engaged with. Um, when I use the term, I emphasize a couple things. First of all, I emphasize the interconnected or linked nature between social and ecological systems, so a social ecological system or an integrated view of humans in environment. And, and when we think about resilience thinking, um, there's, there's really three main aspects. The first is the idea of resilience, and so the capacity of a system to absorb disturbances and reorganize while retaining its same identity or system state. Uh, it involves capacity of actors to influence the system. So here we're talking about adaptability. So how can people influence a system? And that's a learning dimension. And then it also you know, encompasses the capacity to transform um, a system or a stability landscape to 
some different kind of system when our current configuration becomes untenable. So it, resilience thinking encompasses all these different aspects, resilience, adaptability, and transformability. And I know it's a, a big umbrella, so I think one of the ways that we can um, usefully start thinking about some of these ideas at least is to share a little bit about some experiences we've had um, with, with grounding these in real world. And I think taking these concepts and trying to put them in the real world is, is a good way to start making sense of them as we, we continue to grapple with these contemporary challenges in our watersheds. So I want to just share a few examples. The first example I want to um, briefly talk about it comes from Sweden and Kristenstad specifically and roughly translated means water realm. And Kristianstad Vattenreich is an area of Sweden where a number of colleagues at the Stockholm Resilience Center and before that in systems ecology started through the Millennium Ecosystem, Ecosystem Assessment Project to look at how a different type of governance regime came into place. So one that was more towards adaptive governance. And what they found was even though this area um, was very rich in cultural and biological values um, and was a Ramsar site, over time those values were declining. And about 1989, um, there was a recognition of this. And so um, my colleagues spent a great deal of time trying to understand, well, what's the process? How did, how did this change once we had this recognition of declining cultural and, and biological uh, values. And so their research illuminated a number of different things, but a couple of the key ones, the individual pictured on your screen is Sven Erik Magnusson, and he was able to be one of these dynamic leaders, um, innovative leaders that was able to bring different groups together through networks and connect them around ideas associated with their landscape. And so uh, he was able to do that and, and um, through the Eco Museum of Christianstad and in doing so was able to connect them and move them towards a different um, configuration of governance. And through doing so he, um, he and subsequently they were able to pursue a biosphere reserve designation in 2005. You see in the background there's a picture of a brand new nature center or a naturum that they've built. Um, and, and now of course um, they're continuing this work. And so um, conceptually under this umbrella of resilience thinking, there's been a lot of work done on this idea of adaptive co-management and through this process, um, there was a focus on what are the different phases by which we move in this example towards an adaptive multi-level governance approach. And uh, colleague Per Olson, for example, has done a lot of work on you know, the preparation phase when, when much of this uh, work was initially being put in place, then a window of opportunity that opens, and then a building resilience uh, phase. And so that's one e example where we've drawn a lot of inspiration from uh, with resilience thinking in watersheds and then taking that work that was done kind of at the very pioneering stage and saying, well, does it work elsewhere? And so I know many of you are from Canada and as a Canadian, um, we wanted to see do some of these initial ideas transfer and make sense in a Canadian context. And so um, two of the Canadian examples then that I want to share with you, the first one is, is the St. John River Basin in New Brunswick. And um, this particular river basin is, is a fascinating example, I think, for, for all kinds of reasons. Um, but to highlight too, it was our most recent Canadian Heritage River designation. Uh, and in addition to that, or at the same time as that, it was identified in the rivers at risk um, concerning its flow. And you can see on, on your screen the map showing the impoundments and dams and so on on the river system. And so colleagues uh, at the World Wildlife Fund in the process of initiating their Living Rivers Initiative 
contacted us and said, well, we know you've been doing some work with these social ecological systems. Um, is there some work that might be informative? Uh, and their, their intent was to start a dialogue among all the interested parties about the health of this particular river basin. And so we took an initial idea from Sweden and the example that had been done there uh, called the social ecological inventory and we applied it to this particular Canadian river basin. And we looked uh, at four main questions. We wanted to, to see uh, who the actors were in the system, what their understanding or perception of river health was, and also um, what activities they were doing in the landscape. So that's the link to the ecological piece. And then, and then how they themselves connected. And so we identified 190 uh, entities in, in the uh, watershed of 140 different organizations and ended up uh, interviewing 40 of them uh, that were willing to talk to us. And on your screen we see the different activities that we found out that are already going on here in the watershed. And we also um, looked at how those actors connect. And so Julia Baird, who's uh, a key person in our program of research uh, does work on social network analysis. And the size of the nodes here show in degree centrality. So how many times these particular actors were contacted for collaboration. And we can see that this is not a dense network, that there's some key nodes that are contacted very frequently. And also I want to highlight that the light blue nodes are watershed organizations and they really serve as key bridging organizations to connect this network together. So a lot of really interesting information came out of applying this particular idea within resilience thinking on the ground um, with our colleagues uh, in New Brunswick. And Simon Mitchell is, is the point person on that project and is now um, you know, continuing this work forward as, as the Living Rivers initiatives uh, moves on. Another Canadian example that I want to um, just share with you started with a really simple question and it never ceases to amaze me how sometimes we have these questions and, and then they can grow. And so a group of us um, that, that are um, authors on the presentation that I'm giving on our behalf today uh, wondered about you know, can we actually build adaptive capacity in watershed groups themselves through resilience practice? And so resilience practice, we've got a lot of concepts around resilience, but we've got far less experience with it in practice. And Brian Walker's been doing some great work uh, in Australia, but again, how does, that, how does that work in Canada? And so we wanted to look at the East Coast, West Coast, and compare the two. So we looked at the Cowichan Basin in BC, and we looked at the Hammond River Basin in New Brunswick. And in comparing the two, we had a workshop where we got watershed groups together and we introduced some ideas about resilience. From a research perspective, we wanted to empirically measure the degree of learning that took place. And then we went through a series of exercises where we identified values and threats at different scales, and those are the pictures on the screen that you see with all the sticky notes. And then we, we went into further exercises about specified resilience, so threats that we know and how we could respond to those using some state and transition models. And then general resilience, so adaptive capacity and how we can build adaptive capacity to deal with threats that we don't know. And, and here's an example of some of the ideas that came out on that discussion around adaptive capacity. So I wanted to share this example with you because these groups then were able to start developing some ideas around resilience and how they might incorporate that into their own uh, watershed practices and plans. But from a research perspective, we actually were able to measure the amount of learning that took place and different types of learning that took place just from this one workshop. And you'll see that we found in almost every category, learning actually did occur. We're now following this up six months later to see how much of that learning stuck over time and changed. And hopefully, stay tuned, the results from that uh, research will be out shortly. 
I uh, recognize, I'm looking at my watch, that my time's uh, coming to a close. And so I just want to wrap up then with a, a few finishing thoughts before I pass the, the mouse pointer as it is over to Simon. Um, I guess the kind of first main thing I want to just bring together the cases um, and, and in doing that, and again I go back to our typical watershed, I like to use this idea of a compass and I, I use that to say that how we are confronting these contemporary challenges, the types of management that we need to think about and the modes of governance um, that, that we um, use and derive as practitioners and researchers are different and we're going to see different constellations of those in the research that we've done and, and I'm sure for all of you um, in, in the room with us. And so I think that's something that's important to acknowledge at the outset. Even though there's some uniqueness to each of these contexts, um, it doesn't mean, in my opinion at least, that there's not some common touchstones that are really informative to us moving forward as a group. And to that end, I'll just conclude with a few, uh, to me at least, of those touchstones when we're talking about navigating governance around watersheds. And the first one for me is that resilience thinking really helps us uh, to frame the way we think about and understand and engage with these contemporary challenges. As Lynn Ostrom pointed out, and I, I think this is an incredibly critical piece of information, there is no silver bullet, there is no blueprint, there is no patent that we can put on how we navigate watershed governance, and so we need to think and acknowledge that up front. Um, these are not small challenges, they're not small solutions, and it's going to take a long time uh, to find ways forward and that are positive and constructive. I think the best chance we have for success is to learn from each other to embrace experiments that are undergoing in our watersheds worldwide and, and really look at these innovative practices and not to take them and apply them unquestioningly um, but to say what can I learn and how might that be transferable to my watershed and my situation with whatever changes need to be made. I guess last but not least, and I'll end it on this point, I think we as a, a community need to continue to build our capacity for resilience, adaptation and transformation. And I think in our watersheds, in our watershed organizations and our government agencies concerned with watersheds, um, there's also a real opportunity to uh, you know, build towards resilience and, and get ready for both adaptation and transformation. So I'll leave my thoughts there. I think I'm right on time and pass the baton over to Simon. The last thing I want to do uh, is just certainly acknowledge and support my um, co-presenters uh, who, who are all over the world right now, um, but also uh, to acknowledge the, the supporters that we have uh, for our uh, project of research. So, Thank you uh, so much, and I look forward to our discussion following Simon's part of the presentation. That's great, Ryan. Thank you. Um, uh, Laura, can you hear me? Yes, Simon, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me still? I just pushed some more buttons. <laughs> yeah, I can still hear you. Okay, that's great. Well, first of all, great talk, Ryan. It's, it's a joy to be working with you this morning. And a big thank you to, to Laura and Oliver and uh, Polis for giving me the opportunity this morning to talk about one of my favorite things, which is the Canadian Watershed Research Consortium. This is an initiative of the Canadian Water Network. If you're not familiar with us, I, I hope you all are, but if you're not, we're based uh, in Waterloo at the University of Waterloo. We've been around since 2001 and we're funded as a network of centers of excellence. What, what our gig is, what we do, is we bring together decision makers, people who have to make decisions on water, whether it's drinking water, whether it's wastewater treatment, whether it's how we do watersheds, flood control, all of the water issues, help them formulate their questions, and then go to the research community to bring to them the knowledge that they need to address those questions and make the decisions that they have to make. So in this way, we're, as we say, turning the, re the traditional research process on its head 
by starting with the end users. We go to them first, the people who need the information, and then connect them to the people who provide that information. And it can actually end up in uh, an actionable and uh, useful solution. We've done this in a number of areas through developing consortia. And we've done this in pathogens and groundwater, the Canadian Municipal Water Consortium, Secure Source Waters, and the one that we're going to talk about today, the Canadian Watershed Research Consortium. I want to talk a little bit about how that developed. The first thing to say is that it developed through a series of consultations back in 2009 with a series of different groups, provinces, territories, federal departments, industry groups. There's extensive consultation to go to the people who need to make decisions and ask them what is limiting the application of cumulative effects assessment in your watersheds? What, what do you need to do that? As we thought about how to do that, the work of this guy, Lauren Gregg, who works for S Technologies in Ontario, was very influential. In 2006, Lauren worked with Peter Dunker from Dalhousie University, and they looked at the whole business of how we do cumulative effects assessment in Canada. And their conclusion was that while we've talked about it a lot, and we've talked a lot about development of, of, the, of activities around cumulative effects assessment, or CIA concepts, it hasn't lived up to its glowing promise to help achieve sustainability of diverse valued ecosystem components. And their main recommendation was what we need to move towards is regional environmental assessment and regional environmental effects frameworks. What they're talking about here is the way that we do this at the moment is if we're going to build a pulp mill on a watershed, we do an environmental impact assessment, an EIA, and at the end of that process we think about cumulative effects. So we say that, well, we've got the pulp mill here, but we've also got an oil refinery over here, and we've got dredging going on over here. So in aggregate, the effects of those three things will be X, and their effects over years will be Y. And that's the other way to think about cumulative effects, both spatial and time. And what they're saying, what uh, Dunker and Greg were saying is, that hasn't been very effective. What we need instead to do is we need to think about what drives change in that particular watershed well enough and model that well enough that we can make predictions about what changes might, be, uh, might come about as the result of a pulp mill or climate change or forestry, or anything else that we might want to do there. And that's what we knew, need to, uh, to move towards. Now, Lauren was talking about those ideas to Kelly Munkittrick at just the time that Kelly Munkittrick was the incoming scientific director, my predecessor, here at the Canadian Water Network. And that conversation and many other conversations with researchers and with end users resulted in the Canadian Watershed Research Consortium in 2010. So the idea was, we don't know how to do cumulative effects assessment. Let's learn by doing, very much what Ryan was talking about. Let's develop five or six regional monitoring frameworks and partnerships across Canada at the watershed level in support of cumulative effects assessment. Let's give each one of these groups three years of seed money that they can use for research, matching their own funds to do the research they need to support the development of these monitoring frameworks. And these are intended to be legacy projects. These are partnerships and monitoring programs that should continue beyond uh, the CWN funding, the three years of funding, which ends in March 2015, and they'll become self-sustaining. So that, that's the whole idea behind it. The pilot project chosen for this was the St. John Harbor, and I'll talk a little bit about why in a minute. And then there was a competition for which other four or five groups might join the St. John Harbor, and that was in 2011. The groups that were successful in that competition were the Northumberland Strait, where it was about, this is the area between Prince Edward Island and the mainland, and the issue is all about declining fisheries and environmental quality in the strait, and particularly terrestrial impacts, land-based impacts on the estuaries. There were two successful projects in Ontario. One was the Grand River, where it's about population growth, water supply, and quality. And the other was in Mus Muskoka River, where it was all about water quality. And the other one was in Tobacco Creek. And the, area, the issue here in the Red River Valley and Lake Winnipeg Basin was all about how we might do agriculture in a more sustainable way. So these were the five nodes within the Canadian Watershed Research Consortium that initially went ahead. But as you look at that map, you see nothing in the north and you see nothing in western Canada. And that was a great concern. There was a group in uh, the Northwest Territories that had expressed great interest in becoming part of the Watershed Consortium. So in 2012, the Slave River and Delta joined the consortium, and their issues are mainly around First Nation concerns about water quality and the quality of fisheries in those areas. So that's, that's where we are at the moment with six nodes, but you see there's still nothing in Western Canada, and we're concerned about that. What we're working on at the moment is we're having talks with folks in Tumbler Ridge. There's five coal mines in that area run by four coal mining companies, 
and they're very interested in developing a, a communal monitoring program in support of cumulative effects assessment. So we had a meeting with them this spring and also with other industries, the forestry industry, the, uh, the hydrocarbon pipeline industry, uh, government ministries from British Columbia, and First Nations. And we all sat down together and talked about is the kind of approach to develop a monitoring framework in support of cumulative effects assessment, is that going to be helpful? And the answer was a very strong yes. And so a steering committee was formed from that and there's a second meeting of that group coming up uh, early next month. So we're pretty excited about that. But there's other opportunities too. The, the new uh, BC Water Sustainability Act coming in in the spring is really offering some interesting new opportunities, uh, one of which is devolving of some authorities and powers to watershed levels. And the Cowichan uh, group is very interested in how they might discuss going ahead with some of those sorts of, in of initiatives. And they have a workshop coming up next week as well, uh, sorry, next month as well, that, uh, that we'll be participating in. And there's other opportunities. Uh, ShoeSwap has some very interesting opportunities and expressed interest in the consortium some time ago. So there's, there are other opportunities that we are talking about. But let me talk about the pilot project a little bit, just to give you a sense of how these nodes form and how they operate, the kinds of things they do. And so we'll talk about the St. John Harbor project. This formed in 2010, and why there? Well, first of all, as Ryan pointed out in his presentation, there's been a lot of studies done on the St. John River, so there's quite a lot known about this area to start with. Secondly, it was an area of projected development as an energy hub. So there was talk about a second nuclear reactor, a Point Lepro. There was talk about a second oil refinery in the area. There was talk about harbor development, and there was sewage treatment had finally come to this oldest of North American cities. And so there were a number of things happening in this area which all spoke to the issue of cumulative effects. And thirdly, there was a group that could actually help move this all forward, and that was the Canadian Rivers Institute at the University of uh, New Brunswick and St. John. So that group um, held a series of seven meetings over ten months, an absolute flurry of activity to develop the pilot project. They started by saying, who do we need to bring to the table? And the answer was, everybody who is doing monitoring, regulating monitoring, or benefiting from monitoring. All of these groups. So it's the private sector, it's government groups, it's First Nations, it's ENGOs, it's all of these people. And each one of these partners have their own issues. If you take the Port Authority, why are they at the table? They're at the table because they do a harbor dredging program every year. In order to bring in these big cruise ships and, and container ships, they have to dredge sediment out of the harbor that settles each year. And that can be the biggest part of their budget, $4 million a year. They have no predictability on that, and so what they need from this program is to understand better how they might develop prediction in this program of how much sediment there might be, but they also want to ensure that they're uh, carrying out a sustainable dredging program that's not having environmental impact. So that's their reason for being there, and they put considerable resources into this project uh, to match the CWN monies. So each one of the partners talked about why, when, and where they're doing monitoring in this area. They mapped out that on a, on a map so they could talk about where there are redundancies, where they might be able to help each other out, and where there are gaps, where they need to be uh, thinking about uh, doing other monitoring. And from that, they were able to talk about what their priority issues are, what, what are the things they're concerned with knowing more about. And they decided what they wanted to know more about and what they wanted to monitor going forward were contaminants in the sediment and in the biota, and the biota itself, the fish and the invertebrates that live in the harbor. That's what they wanted to know more about. So armed with that, they put together a request for research proposals, which went out in uh, February 2011. Very quick turnaround, the proposals came in in uh, the next month, and they were reviewed by a, an expert international panel for scientific excellence and by a panel of local members to make sure they fit well with the request for uh, the research proposals. A success, a success, the successful proposals were uh, selected in April and the work went ahead and I'll tell you what's going on on that. And um, that work will wrap up in uh, the fall and we'll have final uh, reports from that. The first thing that the partnership did when it had its researchers selected was it sat down with them and they decided on six stations in the harbor that they wanted to use as background reference monitoring areas. So these are areas that should be typical of the harbor and tell us more about that. Three in the outer harbor, three in the inner harbor. And then went out to these areas over time and looked at the contaminants, the fish, and the benthos. So this is some contaminants work from a grab that you can see in the picture here. The grab comes up, they're able to take a sample of sediment, and they're able to then go into the lab and analyze that. These are zinc levels in the inner harbor. 
and you can see that band of yellow. That's the range of normal for all six of the stations chosen. That's what, that's what three standard deviations around the average looks like. And from that, you can then go and look at other sites in the harbor, the red sites along the x-axis, and you can see that most of them fit within that yellow band of normal, but some don't. So we can get some idea of where we have hot spots and contaminants, and also how things change over time. Also, each time the grab comes up, we take some of the mud and analyze it for benthic infauna, the animals that live in the sediments. And this allows us to characterize the community for its richness and its abundance, allows us to make decisions on when is the best time to look at that community to develop an index of, of, of how the, what the health is of the harbor, and also to select some sentinel species going forward. The fish side of things was more difficult for us. We were able to catch fish, but not enough, and frequently enough, for the monitoring program. So while we're still pursuing that, what we moved towards was what you see on the right-hand side middle part, looking at caged mussels. So we can take blue mussels and put them out in these cages that you see and leave them for several months and then look at the growth, the survival, and the reproduction of those mussels and also how they're accumulating toxins. And finally, we're looking at, as in the bottom right, we're looking at uh, fish larvae and eggs as an indication of reproduction and nursery sites within the harbor. And the sand shrimp in the very far right bottom is an indicator, well, we're looking at it as a potential indicator of the health of the very near shore area. So these are the kinds of things that are being done in St. John Harbor to develop this monitoring program. But just to finish up, if we were to do all of this, where might we be in five years? And the example I really love is from Morton Bay Waterways and Catchment Partnership, the Healthy Waterways Program in uh, southeast Queensland, Australia. So this is halfway down the right-hand side of Australia and where they've got this, this basin of Morton Bay and they've developed this monitoring program in the freshwater, the estuary, and right down into the salt water using biological, physical, and chemical indicators of water quality. And they use that, they've, they've mapped out how these indicators tell us about the health of the system and how they are mapped back to activities on land and so on. And they use that to put together an annual report card of the health of these areas. And these report cards have gained such credibility that local politicians have to respond to them in terms of management measures. So for example, when they thought they had a problem with nutrients in Morton Bay, a sewage treatment plant was built. And they could then use this program to look at the success of that sewage treatment plant in mitigating that particular uh, uh, problem and then design next steps from there. So that's the kind of thing that we can do as we move forward. So looking ahead at the Canadian Watershed Research Consortium, what is the conversation that we're having? We just had a meeting earlier this spring where we brought the six nodes together in Toronto for a workshop to, to say where are we in the work that we're doing towards developing monitoring frameworks in support of cumulative effects assessment and where are we, where are we going to go? We talked about the development of new nodes. I talked about that a little bit earlier, how we're trying to work with uh, some different groups in British Columbia to see if we could develop something in the West. We talked about maintaining the partnerships and monitoring programs after CWN funding um, in March 2015. Remember, these are meant to be legacy projects. They're meant to become self-sustaining. So the question is, how are the different groups getting on with that, with how they're going to maintain their partnerships and their monitoring programs going forward? Thirdly. How are they going to tie their monitoring to management? This is not monitoring for monitoring's sake. This is monitoring that we want to see ending up resulting in, in policy and regulation. So how do actions to make the world a better place actually happen from this monitoring program? Fourth, continuing to interact with the other nodes in a national consortium. Is that important for the St. John group, for the Tobacco Creek group, for the, for the Great Slave, for the Slave River and the Delta group? Or do they want to continue on just within their own area? So that's a conversation that we are having. And finally, the role of the Canadian Water Network going forward to sustain, to help the nodes, but also to help how they might communicate with each other. So that's, that's a thumbnail sketch of what we're trying to do in the Canadian Watershed Research Consortium. There's much more information on this on the website, which I've listed here. And I, I'll stop there and really look forward to the discussion that we'll have on it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Simon, and, and also Ryan. Um, so now is the, the point in the webinar where we, we open up the floor to all of you who are listening. Um, I, I welcome you to use the chat box, type any questions that you might have for Ryan or Simon or both of them, um, and, I'll, and I'll read those out. Um, I will bring up um, a few resources that you may be interested in. 
Um, let me, I need to do a little, little house cleaning here to make space. <laughs> um, the first is a summary of the resilience analysis workshop that happened in, um, in the couch and watershed, which Ryan mentioned. Um, the second is, is a number of documents and presentations from the Watersheds 2014 Forum that we had out here on Vancouver Island back in January. And the third link there is to the Canadian Water Network website, which Simon just mentioned has a lot more information and resources on the consortium. Okay, so first question here from Marta. This question is for Ryan. Uh, great overview of resilience. I've been using resilience thinking in a variety of settings in my work, mostly as an approach to research. But recently there's been a push to develop metrics to measure resilience. These metrics would go beyond carrying out resilience assessment based on the resilience workbook. Do you have any thoughts on that, Ryan? That is a fantastic question. and. Um I, I do actually. Um, so one of the large challenges, I think at least, uh, when we're talking about resilience and social ecological resilience specifically, is what would those um, metrics even look like if we're thinking more on, on the social side? And so uh, some early work on the ecological side um, used surrogates for resilience, and so sometimes we wouldn't even want to try to ex do some of these experiments, and so what are proxy measures that we would use to indicate that, um, you know, we're making progress towards resilience? Uh, so that's, that's one challenge, what would we actually use? Um, and to start getting an idea about that, and this was a, a research question we, um, we shared, so it's just fantastic to, to see this as front of mind for you also. Um, we wanted to actually find out what experts out there thought about what attributes would actually uh, signal resilience in watersheds. And so we've actually just finished up a uh, Delphi study of individuals internationally that write about resilience in the context of aquatic systems. And we specifically asked them um, what they would put forward as uh, attributes that characterize resilience for governance in aquatic systems in terms of both specified resilience and general resilience. And um, we're just doing the analysis on the results now, um, and, and I'd certainly be happy to, to share that as soon as uh, that's finished. Um, I guess the other thing I'd just throw out there, though, is I think it's, it's a really important discussion that with, with resilience, sometimes we want to be careful, too, that, um, you know, these are experiments in, in real life settings. And so the questions about, you know, resilience, well, resilience just is, and then it's a value concept that we as humans put on what part of resilience we think is good. So some people might think one state is good. Other people might think another state is desirable. Uh, and so I just put that out there as well, that, um, you know, when we get into metrics and, and people putting values on these things, it, you know, it raises a whole different set of questions also. Thanks, Ryan. Next question is from Derek Reed, um, raising um, a comment about some challenges, difficulty in collecting useful data needed for management um, while hydrology, hydrogeology, and demands are changing and fluctuating so rapidly, um, and also the relevance of historical or current data in predicting future freshwater resources and demands um, in specific bioregions. So um, I think open to both of you, just what are your thoughts on this sort of fluctuating landscape and, and trying to pin down some things within it? This is Simon. Let me, let me take a first kick at that and then, and then Ryan can correct me. Uh, the, the, the first thing I'd say about this is that it, it's really quite challenging to know what to measure, what is meaningful to measure when you're developing a monitoring program. One of the approaches to that that was adopted by the Northumberland Strait Environmental Monitoring Partnership was one that the Europeans have used, and, and that's the DIPSER, the, the Drivers, Pressures, State, Impact, and Response Framework. And basically what this is all about is trying to map out pathways of effects. So 
it's saying that if you're concerned, first of all, you want to measure out what are your valued ecosystem components. What are the things that you care about and that you're concerned about in your watershed? If, if the things that you're concerned about in the estuaries of Prince Edward Island, for example, are, are eutrophication issues, that you, you think you might have too much nutrient in your estuary that is resulting in algal blooms and in turn resulting in low levels of oxygen. Um, what are the pathways that lead to that? How relatively important is sewage that comes in, for example, as a source of nutrient? How relatively important is agriculture? How relatively important are other things that happen? So one of the things that I'd say about that is, and we had a lot of conversations about this is, there are a thousand things you can measure, but what if you could only, if, if your money and your time and your effort were limited, what are the top three that you would look at? What are the ones that are going to be most meaningful to you in helping make management decisions about how you would change things in that area? And that's really where we've gone. We've tried to say, let's think about pathways of effects, and in the Northumberland case, using the Dipser pathway. So I'll, I'll stop there and let Ryan chime in. Thanks, Simon. I mean, I think um, Derek raised a great point, and I mean, I think this is this whole transition we're in right now in the way we understand and think about these systems. And so in, in Simon's talk, I think he, he said it quite nicely that, you know, there's no point in mo monitoring for monitoring's sake, um, and, and somehow, you know, that has to, um, I think in Simon's slide, he, he had it linked back to, to management, and I would push even further and say that you know, we need to think about what that means in terms of governance and um, even even larger implications. And so your questions about, uh, for example, in water, with the death of stationarity, which we made most of our assumptions were predicated upon, means we need to think about this in a totally different way. And so to me, at least, it's how we incorporate the monitoring um, that, that Simon was discussing um, and cumulative effects with our governance systems of how we interact with these watersheds. And, and I think we need to do that, um, you know, before, before we have all the answers or all the information um, because it's an iterative adaptive process. Before I um, go to the next more substantial question, there's a few people sort of sharing links and resources that I want to draw your attention to. One is uh, some, some research from the Rockefeller Foundation trying to synthesize key characteristics of resilience. You can see that in your chat box. Um, and also a web link here to um, resilience.org. One question in the, in the box here, Ryan and Simon, um, is saying it would be helpful to see sort of a one page of links to information on resilience. I don't know if that's something particularly, Ryan, that that has been developed, um, or if that's something that we could think about maybe circulating after the webinar. Yeah, we can, I mean, there's there's a number of different um, places that have various uh, kind of uh, top sites, if you will, and sources to get information about uh, resilience. Um, I think the, the challenge that most of us are having right now, it's just been such an explosion in the literature trying to keep a finger on it. Um, and also what type of resilience is another real challenge. Um, yeah. But, you know, certainly coming out of some of our work, um, I think we could probably look at a one-pager that you might be able to share, Laura, out of our, uh, out of our CWN work in BC. Yeah, great. Yep. Um, so I hope that addresses that, that question. Um, so the next question comes from Oliver Brandis, my colleague here at Polis, um, directed to Simon asking, how will the resilience issues uh, introduced by Ryan in his presentation um, around uncertainty and the complex nature of watersheds be addressed in future monitoring and cumulative effects assessments of the consortium supported program? Yeah, this is, that's a challenging question, Oliver. Thank you for that. The, this also, I think, relates a little bit to Rick Simpson's question, uh, which is a little bit further down, um, on the whole business of, of carrying capacity. Um, what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop models, stressor-based models, so that we understand these pathways of effect, that if you do this on land, if you introduce this to the water, you end up with this change um, in the valued ecosystem component that you're concerned with. And, and one of the things that the literature has shown us is that there are tipping points, that, that systems do not necessarily change gradually over time. They may 
show no change, and then suddenly you have a precipitous change to a new state. Um, and it's sometimes a state from which you cannot recover simply by removing whatever pressure it was that, that got you there. So this is something that we're, by, by developing these stressor-based models, we're trying to understand what the connections are between anthropogenic activities and changes in, in the ecosystem. Well, and just one other thing I'd put uh, in that conversation is that this whole business about how we develop triggers in monitoring programs for when we know that we've got to a point where we have to pay attention and either put in another level of monitoring to better understand why things are changing as they are, or put in a management measure to, to mitigate what's going on or, or correct what's going on. Th th this is a big issue and one that we don't know enough about. So Kelly Monkittrick, uh, from who is now working with COSIA, brought uh, Lauren Gregg, who I mentioned earlier uh, today from ESSA, and a number of people together at a workshop uh, just uh, earlier this month to talk about triggers, to talk about how we do that in monitoring programs. Should it be a, a quantitative thing? I showed that, that band of what is normal for zinc levels in St. John Harbor. Is that the kind of trigger we want, that when you exceed that band, it's time to do something different? Um, or should it be something that is more based on an ecological parameter, like carrying capacity, that we know that when you get to a certain level of zinc, you tend to lose fish, for example. And, and that's an ongoing conversation. It's not something that has been well established yet. Um, there will be a, a paper coming out from that workshop, so there will be a, a continuing of that conversation, but I can tell you the answer isn't there yet. Okay, the next um, question, I don't know, Barbara Veal had to leave. She may, may or may not still be in the room, but I'm going to skip to her question next in case she is still here, um, asking how does resilience thinking relate to integrated watershed management? Uh, it seems to her that both concepts are all about looking at a suite of activities and cooperative arrangements to deal with complex issues in a way that is adaptable and flexible to deal with uncertainty and risk. So uh, it's, a, again, I think a great, a great question. And to me, um, in some of the work that, that we've done and some of the writing that I've um, done myself, I mean, I, I describe this as one of these fuzzy boundaries. And certainly, as scholars, um, frequently, you know, concepts are developed with, with predicated on previous ideas. And there is no it's a clear demarcation between them. Uh, integrated water resource management has, has been with us for a long time. It's promoted worldwide and, and held up as a model approach to things. Um, and they certainly share, in my opinion, many commonalities. And I think Barb's pointed out uh, in her question a number of the similarities. The, um, I think at least, uh, you know, the fundamental differences um, from, you know, integrated resource management, depending on who, whose version you're following, and you know, resilience thinking is a that emphasis on the integration between social and ecological systems, and looking at them as a social ecological system. Uh, second of all, the uh, the fact that resilience thinking is predicated on a nature evolving perspective um, means that there's fundamentally different assumptions that we're going into um, these governance arrangements with. And, and so even though some of the arrangements may look very similar to integrated water resource management, um, you know, the way that we're understanding the system is really quite different. Uh, and so as opposed to a nature balance perspective, which I think integrated resource management, um, and certainly when it started, still had as its perspective. Um, and, th and then I think the other point of real emphasis is, is on the uh, adaptation uh, and the experiment and the learning portion of uh, resilience thinking, which doesn't have to the same extent uh, an emphasis in integrated resource management. So just a few you know, distinctions I would make, um, but, but certainly recognize there is a fuzzy boundary between them. And, and I think Barb quite nicely points out where that fuzzy boundary is. Yeah, this is Simon. I, I'll just add a bit to that. Certainly, I, I, it's too bad that Barb couldn't stay on the call because, you know, certainly through her work with the Grand River and uh, her own research, she knows a great deal about this issue um, and has a, a lot to share on this. Um, 
just, I guess I'm really delighted that uh, the phrase integrated watershed management, integrated resource management has come into the conversation because of course that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about how we do this. And one of the points that, that Lauren Gregg made at a recent workshop that we were attending was that in his experience of how these things go, um, the development of the monitoring framework and the monitoring program is something that we actually know quite a bit about and that we're probably going to be able to do that it's, it's technically difficult to do and it's resource intensive, but it's something that we know how to do. The ultimate success or failure of this whole initiative when we're talking about the watershed consortium, when we're talking about integrated watershed management, is the structures that we build of the partners around doing this, getting the right people to the table, keeping the right people at the table, a process of continual re-engagement, and when we find that we haven't got all the right people at the table, having somebody who can do the job of going out there and bringing those people to the table. It's, and then putting in place the right governance structures for how we, how we manage these things. And it's the people on the front lines who are obviously going to do this best. So I, I think it's those kinds of considerations and, and the kinds of work that Ryan has been doing in identifying how people are talking to each other and communicating and how the, how the communication and, and knowledge transfer actually happens it's absolutely key in thinking about designing uh, infrastructure that will work and, and sustain itself. So another question of uh, sort of maybe fuzzy boundaries or, or semantics um, from Rick Simpson um, for both Ryan and Simon. Um, in your work, do you or any of the people you work with differentiate between cumulative impacts assessment and carrying capacity assessment? Um, and if you do, um, would you be able to elaborate on that? I'm going to defer to you on, on this one, Simon. <laughs> I, beyond, beyond what I said earlier on this one, I, I don't have a lot that I can offer. Um, I think, it, it, to me, it, it all comes back to understanding pathways of effects. And when we reach these trigger points, when we reach these tipping points at which the environment changes, um, there are a number of, the environment has a certain capacity to absorb uh, impacts from various things that we do. And, and that's the other thing to, to remind ourselves of, that, that we're not really managing watersheds. We're really managing human activities in, on, and around the water. That's, that's what we're able to actually affect change in. And, and one of the things that, we've, that uh, some of our colleagues have paid considerable attention to is looking at the policy and governance frameworks policy and regulatory frameworks um, that we have to use as levers for these sorts of things. So understanding what the capacity is of the environment to absorb um, particular anthropogenic stresses and when things are changing and developing the indicators that are sensitive to those changes so that we know in advance um, whether things uh, whether we're getting to a point that we don't want to be. One of the, one of the criteria for choosing good indicators is not that things have changed, but rather that change is coming. You want to catch it before um, damage has been done that you can't recover from. And I just want to add one uh, small minor point, I guess, and, and a pick up on something that you said, Simon, and that is, you know, this idea about, you know, we're trying to manage and it's, it's human activity. I mean, I think one of the, the key take-home messages um, with resilience thinking is that um, with specified resilience, there are some threats that are known, that we know, and that we might want to prepare for or, or plan for or take actions towards um, if we want to keep a state in a certain um, place or identity or not. Um, but, then, but then general resilience uh, you know, uh, teaches us that there's also unexpected ones, and, and one of the kind of common sayings in resilience thinking is expect the unexpected. And so, um, you know, and though there's a tension between, you know, the threats that we're aware of and the things that we're not aware of. And, and when we dedicate our resources, whether those are monitoring or whether they're our time or our effort as watershed groups, um, you know, we have to make a conscientious trade-off between how we allocate the resources that we have towards what we want to prepare for and, and building capacity for what we don't even know. And I think that's where resilience thinking really, um, you know, might have something to say about, you know, cumulative effects and, and take it, you know, even in a, a, an enhanced or an enriched direction in light of contemporary environmental challenges. 
You know, it's, it's fascinating, Ryan, as uh, how often Donald Rumsfeld comes up these days. With this came up at uh, this Triggers workshop that Kelly held as well, you know, that the whole business, that there are things that we know, there are things that we don't know, and there are things that we don't know that we don't know. And those are the ones that catch you. And so how do you build in that safety margin, that, that level of buffer for the things that you don't know about? I mean, climate change is one of the things that we're wrestling with now. And it's going to change absolutely everything around water, whether we're talking about flood control, whether we're talking about drinking water. It doesn't matter. It's all going to be about climate change. There are some things we know about that, but there's a whole bunch that we don't know about that. And how do you build in that safety? And, and again, I mean, this is another, I think, going back to Barb's question, really important distinction that, that you know, we, and it's, I mean, resilience thinking is one of a number of different ways of thinking about um, the world and how we understand it. But I think it's, one of its big contributions are, is the multi-scale facet and is the dynamism of these systems and this uncertainty and how we might engage with uncertainty. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a fascinating new frontier. So I'm just going to jump around a little, a comment from uh, Susanna Bruno, um, playing off of what you guys were saying, just saying that I think the distinction of managing human activities and not managing water and other natural processes is important. Um, that is a specific mindset and worldview, understanding we can't control nature. I think the idea we can control nature is still a prevalent worldview. So I don't know if either of you have any additional thoughts on that comment from Susanna. No, well, Simon, just that I completely agree. Um, I think that you know the, this is the whole concept of stewardship um, that that the environment is ours to protect and, and preserve. Um, and not just for what we're doing with it now, but for all of the un unforeseen things that might come later. Um, it's, it's not ours to, to uh, destroy, it's ours to protect what comes next. Um, and another comment slash question from Julia Robinson saying, uh, I'm sympathetic to resilience and complex, complex system thinking. However, um, she's afraid that we often underestimate the resilience of existing social systems. Uh, specifically the resilience of economic systems. Uh, she mentions growth, consumption, commodification of resources, or belief systems such as control or engineering solutions. Um, she says these systems are demonstrating a lot of resilience, but it's often assumed they can be changed with information. Um, how does this impact governance around watersheds? Yeah. And I mean, I, I read that and just I'm really enjoying uh, reading the comments and thank you very much for, for that one in particular. I think it's an important point. Um, and, and in that regard, there's been a fair amount of work done on lock-in traps. And I think, you know, in, in light of the comment also about the way we kind of tend to view nature and try to control it, I mean, I think we're entrenched, uh, speaking broadly, in that lock-in trap, which is which is why uh, some of these alternative modes of governance um, are, you know, described as novel or innovative. And I guess in my talk, that's why I, I suggest that, you know, we will get these little glimmers of, of hope or of experimentation. And those are where we might see some real progress because so much of society is locked in to these, these ways of um, viewing the world and, and acting and governing. So great comment. The, the one thing that I'd add is uh, there certainly is inertia. There's no doubt about it. The interesting thing to me is where there is opportunity for change. And it's interesting in where we generate information, where we do research, where, where knowledge comes from. You know, there's the, there's the private sector, there's universities, uh, there's the public sector with government labs, for example. The area that I see most opportunity for change and for new innovation is in the private sector at the moment, in industry. Give you an example. We um, wanted to develop a better way of monitoring the environmental impacts of pulp and paper mill effluent, and we worked with a pulp mill um, in uh, eastern Canada, and and these people were absolutely fantastic. They basically said, we, "We hear what you're saying. The kinds of things that the kinds of monitoring approaches that there are that we've used in other areas aren't appropriate for our receiving environment where we discharge our effluent into the ocean. It may it means that we need to look at a different approach." Let's go. Let's do this thing. And and they did this knowing that everything that we did, because we were working with public money, 
most of the money, all virtually all money is, is public in one form or another, that all of the information would become public. And they did this knowing they would see the information first and so be better prepared for it. But they were very proactive in developing a new monitoring program. And I'm seeing more and more examples of that. In fact, we, we had a workshop a little while ago where people were talking about this and saying, it isn't industry that's holding back on developing better monitoring approaches. It's the regulatory framework that isn't there to allow that. And then that's something that we see in the discussion about hydraulic fracturing, for example. So I think there's a lot of flexibility in the private sector if we can get the regulatory framework right. So before I get to the next question, I just want to point out again that um, there's a few more resources being shared in the chat box. I'm sure most of you are seeing those, but um, Robin Ford says if you search development resilience, you can see re material from her um, world. So many are operating in this area. Um, and Hymena has, has posted an, an article there um, that may be of interest to some of you. So question from uh, Marta Verbies. I hope, I hope I'm saying your last name correctly there. Um, I guess that a practical application of resilience thinking in a watershed setting would be adaptive environmental management. Um, could you speak to the challenges of implementing AEM, adaptive environmental management? I'm pretty sure that's a Ryan question. I was, I was curious if you wanted me to take a stab at that or if you were going to. Um, most of my experience is, and the acronym that we use is ACM, or Adaptive Collaborative Management. Um, and I, I bring that in because in line with resilience thinking, um, so it has, it combines the collaborative approach that we've had or the collaborative narrative, the natural resource management with the adaptive management piece of it and marries them together in, in a dynamic process. Um, it is an incredibly challenging uh, way to undertake or engage in governance because you know you engage the actors or stakeholders, government agencies, um, citizens in the water, uh, watershed or water resource that you're interested in. And so there's that collaborative element, but the adaptive part is that once you get a collaborative group, and I talked about the different phases, once you get through the preparation phase and there's an opportunity to get the group to do something, that adaptive piece really is, is the connection, I think, to Simon's uh, presentation and work about the monitoring piece. And so the activities that you undertake the information that you have, and I think Simon quite nicely pointed out that you know it's not about monitoring for monitoring's sake, it's not about trying to discern everything we could possibly monitor. I mean, adaptive environmental management says, you know, there's various models, but if you kind of go with the, the common five-step model, um, you know, we take this information, we do an action, and then we monitor it, and then we feed it back. And we make our next decision based on what happened. And so, that logic is quite good, and we want to incorporate that iterative process. And in our area, and I'm speaking to you on the Niagara Peninsula sandwich between two Great Lakes, I mean, the IJC right now is doing some really interesting um, work and in orienting themselves more towards this adaptive approach. And so that might be an interesting case for you. Um, I guess the challenge in that, certainly when we're talking about ecological systems, but also social systems that are locked, is the time scale for which you see feedback uh, may or may not be quick. And so trying to, to again, make and incorporate that adaptive element uh, is, a, is also a challenge. But um, it's, a, it's a really, it's an essential way to move forward. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say on it is, is also that the fit between the governance system or the adaptive management or adaptive co-management approach and the system that you're engaged with or governing, I mean, that, that fit is a critical issue. Um, and so this is where scale and multi-scale also comes in. That, that's a great answer. The, the only thing I would add to that, I think, is, is one observation from the recent uh, inter-node workshop we held of bringing the six nodes of the watershed consortium together. And, and we were talking a little bit about um, the iterative approach that, you know, yet as you go through your do your monitoring, 
uh, in response to particular questions. You get some answers. Um, that generates other questions. You go around again. And one of the things that I guess I hadn't really thought enough about um, was the question about when, is, when do you have enough research? When can the research stop? And because of this iterative nature to this whole process, the researchers pointed out that it doesn't actually ever stop. And you, you will need to build a research component into what you're doing going forward because there will be new, the, the work that you're doing as you learn more about the pathways of effect from human activities to changes in the watershed will raise other questions that need to be explored. And so you need to keep some research capacity in the mix uh, going forward. So it, it looks like the questions are slowing down a little bit. Um, I, we have about 15 minutes officially left on the clock. If we wrap up before then, um, that's totally fine. So I just want to encourage you, if you do have any last questions, to, to please type them in now. Um, and the next question we have is from Oliver again from here at Polis asking, is there a role for traditional indigenous ecological knowledge in the consortium approach? Um, to which Rick Simpson has commented that, uh, yes, this is an important question, and, and this is an area that's often overlooked and or undervalued. I, I can take a first kick at that, at, at Simon. Um, the, the answer is absolutely yes, of course. The, uh, Western science is one way of knowing, but it's not the only way. And um, one of the things that uh, we're looking at in a separate uh, Canadian Water Network project, uh, knowledge integration project, is the, the integration of t uh, traditional ecological knowledge um, and Western science, how we bring these things together to answer all questions around water, but including uh, watershed issues. And we, we've been very lucky um, at, on the East Coast. Uh, we have uh, a water grandmother who works with us in the Canadian Rivers Institute who has been able to help us uh, connect to First Nations and, and some of the, the, the great amount of information that they have available. Uh, for our, our watershed nodes uh, in New Brunswick. So that's actually been very helpful. Great. Thank you, Simon. Um, it looks like a couple people might still be typing, but so yeah, we'll just wait a little bit to wait for their comments to roll in. While we're waiting for that, I will remind all of you who are who are on the line that this is the last session in this year's series, um, but we will be back in the fall with our Creating a Blue Dialogue series again. Usually we do five sessions a year. Um, oh, it, it, was, it was a World Cup update that we were waiting to come in on the chat box. <laughs> Germany just scored for those of you who are rooting, <laughs> rooting Germany. Um, so yeah, we'll be back in the fall. We generally do five sessions a year. So those of you who are on the line, if you don't get our, our webinar invitations, um, please send me a note and I can make sure that, that you're linked in to, to receive those. Um, so yeah, basically stay tuned for info on that. The other thing that I'll let you know is that all of the sessions, including today's sessions, we do record them. Um, and they're housed on our YouTube channel, and the link the link to our YouTube channel is right there. So you can view all the archived webinars, and I'll be circulating this one as well. Um, and Ryan, you and I can talk about um, some sort of maybe one pager of resources, which a couple people had had said would be useful. Um, and uh, the other question that had come through the chat box earlier is if if we can circulate the slides as a PDF. Are you two um, open to that? Yep, no problem. Yeah, cer certainly the only challenge with mine is with the um, animations and such, if they're static, it may look quite messy. Okay, yeah, I'll see what it looks like when we when we convert it, but between the, the PDF and the recorded presentation, I think that people can probably sort themselves out. Great. Um, one question that just came through from Deborah Jarvie, um, just asking, is, is there much lit literature contrasting the Western view of sustainability with First Nations views? Um, do either of you have any sort of thoughts in that in that field? I, I, I must admit I'm no expert on that. I'm hoping that the review that we're um, that's presently been engaged by CWN on this will will help shine some light on that. But uh, I, I I'm not an expert myself. Yeah, and unfortunately it's it's outside of my uh, area of expertise at all, and I don't want to speculate. I know 
Um, Sue Vonderporten just finished her PhD work at um, University of Waterloo and is now uh, engaged as a postdoc in, in BC and that was uh, an area that, that she's done extensive work on so I, as a contact person I think she might be able she might be the most appropriate person to uh, answer that question. Okay so maybe Deborah if you want to send me an email um, I could connect you with Sue Von Important's work um, and it sounds like Rick Simpson here in the chat box uh, may also have some references for you so um, if you just want to email me communications at polisproject.org um, I can I can link you to those to those folks so I think that our question period has has wound down that you can feel the energy sort of waning there um, I want to thank both of you Simon and Ryan for your time and your expertise and your presentations and um, this wonderful discussion session I think um, this was quite robust today and also I want to thank those of you who are still on the line. I know a number of you have had to leave for other commitments. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and, and thank you, Laura. It's, uh, I've really enjoyed the discussion. This is Simon. Um, and thanks, Ryan. And thanks all for your questions. Very much appreciated. Yeah, I just wish everybody a, a wonderful day from our weather forecast across the country and elsewhere <laughs> in the world. It sounded like most places were sunny skies. And uh, just enjoy, enjoy the day. And thanks so much for your time. Great. Take care, everybody. And as I said, you'll hear from me in the coming months, and we'll be back in the fall. Okay. Very best. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.